All right, we are recording. Oh, I love the happy face. That's wonderful. Now, um, welcome to everyone who's, who's here. We're going to, this is great. Maybe we'll come back to this slide at the uh, very end of the presentation. I'm honored to have Anastasia and Craig in the room as moderators. They'll be running the chat end of things and helping me keep track of the important questions as I go through this. Um, I'm going to turn the whiteboard permissions off. So today we're talking about how to use puppets to promote student learning. I'm going to be sharing some of my experience over the last year or so, sharing some of the puppets I've made. I'm going to try to use video sparingly because I know that it's difficult for some people without good bandwidth to see that video, uh, but we will be using it occasionally. I have a set of links and videos at bethedistraction.org where there's more detailed stuff available, so you can even follow along and kind of use the Google Doc that's linked off via the distraction.org if you like. Um, if I need to add something to, if I need to add a doc in during the presentation, I'm going to add it there. Um, if you look up here, these are <coughs> some of the puppets I've built who have Twitter accounts. Um, my puppets do tweet. And oh, Walker, you know, Walker's right there. Uh, my puppets do tweet, and I do have fun on social media with my puppets. It's kind of an extension, exploration of what they do. I think it helps me uh, kind of develop them more as a personality. Uh, we'd love to have you as followers, and we'd love to have you join in that fun. Now, there we go. So I haven't really been making puppets for a very long time. Basically, well, okay, it's not completely true. There's one puppet I should show you that isn't on this slide. Hi, guys. And this puppet showed up in a box from my mom not too long ago. And I made this puppet when I was 12 or 13. Um, it is a dragon puppet, and it is made of felt. It's a very simple pattern felt pattern hand puppet, and uh, yeah, all of my other friends were saving up for broadswords and designing Renaissance Fair costumes, and I was learning to juggle and making puppets. Um, so here's the, uh, here's the actual video of that. You can see how beautiful the dragon is. I don't even know necessarily what his name is, but I was interested in making puppets in high school, and I knew a little bit about sewing, but then I couldn't really figure out where that was going, so I figured I should get to work and, you know, develop a career. So I got into teaching, I got into writing, I got into poetry, and many, many years later, I uh, found myself doing work with video in education, and I kept having to make these videos really early in the morning. So I thought, you know, I really should do something about that. So what I did, I, I mean, I just didn't enjoy being in the videos. What I needed to do something about was the fact that I was making them at 5 in the morning, and I hadn't gone to the gym yet, and I looked like heck, and I needed to, like, build the support material, which I wasn't awake enough to do at the end of my day, the day previous. So I needed to um, really kind of find a way that I could have somebody be in the video that wasn't me. And I believe that videos need to have faces in them. Um, eyeballs drive engagement is something I've been known to say. So the um, the move for puppets made a lot of sense to me. And originally I started with a couple finger puppets, and then I said, you know, I really need some better puppets. And that brings us to this issue of making versus buying. I make most of my puppets, and the reason is I have this idea that at some point maybe I will want to do something with these videos that I make, even if they're instructional videos for my class. And 
I honestly don't know what the copyright issues are around taking somebody else's created copyrighted puppet and doing a bunch of work with it and trying to claim it as your own. Obviously, if my puppets are going to have mature personalities, I probably want them to be my own puppets because then I'm making them from scratch and I'm not having to, like, copy someone else's work as far as the personality. Um, so patterns, puppet patterns, you can buy puppet patterns online from a number of different sources. And if you're not into making your own, you know, go for it. They're, they're, they were a little expensive for me, so I kind of took the challenge on of figuring out how to create my own puppet patterns, which, you know, did take a lot of time. Um, I'm going to try to open this polling option. Let me, polling type, ABC, multiple choices. So... This question here, I'd love for you to answer it as a poll. Um, if you, yes, next to raise the hand, we should be able to, okay, there we go. It's just kind of we're using a check. And so we've got two people who, have, who do use and two people who don't. Anybody else want to weigh in there? There we go. Thank you, Craig, for directing people to that. I think I can display those. Yeah, there we go. So working on, I, I'm glad your students love it. And students do love it. And uh, one of the things that we're going to talk about as we talk about grade level work is how students at different grade levels get into it differently. Um, but there is a whole lot there as far as engagement and driving uh, just focus, as well as bringing that energy of play into the classroom. Um, I think that's really important. Let's try another one here. Um, need to set the poll type to... I just get to A through E. It doesn't go all the way to F or G or H. So I guess use, uh, yeah, I guess you're just going to have to type it into the chat box if you're uh, F, G, or H from B to G, right? There you go. That's a great range. And it's interesting because I work in a, a large range of grades also. So I find myself using puppets very differently in different age groups. Kids just really respond to them very, very differently. So good. It seems like we've got some, a good mix of experience and levels in the room. Uh, and as we go, just feel free to share questions. I've broken what we're talking about today up into a couple different sections. Um, the first one is really about kind of the pedagogy of instructing with a puppet. Um, oh, hey, Jackie. How are you? It's, yeah, my high school girls, I'm just going to digress here. Jackie's saying she's amazed at how much high school girls got into puppets. When I rolled these out in ninth grade, three girls, first thing, can I bring in my sewing machine? And they were jazzed, and they did amazing work with the puppets. And I have never been able to bring sewing or anything like that into a conversation like this before. So that was really cool. I currently teach grades K through 5 technology integration. So I'm a specials teacher, as they say. And that means I have essentially one hour a week with the students. Last year, I was teaching ninth grade through 11th grade English. Um, and that's really where I started with the puppets. So when we um, work with puppets, we have to, you know, stay flexible and work in many different ways with many different students. For the younger kids, 
Uh, I really focus on using puppets as a transition activity. Um, so when I come into the first grade class and it's time for technology and they're in the middle of uh, one of their other classes, whether it's their science class or their language class, and it's and I come into the class, it's not uncommon for me to have Waka with me. Uh, he works with me all the time. And Waka will start talking with the kids. And even just bringing Waka out and having him just kind of stand there in the room with me, the kids begin thinking about technology and really begin focusing on that. And um, it's a great way to kind of drive it. And when I started the tech class with the students, I brought in Waka first. I didn't bring in the iPads. No, because it's not really about the tech, right? It's about learning and relationships and getting them to key into kind of who I am or who he is. Or they always like shout my name or his name on the playground, always want to know where I am. I actually gave them an opportunity to interview two of the puppets. So it was interesting because I learned a lot about the students and their experience with technology. And then um, that and then kind of learned about how they interact, where their comfort level is. So that's kind of talking a little bit about using puppets as a relationship builder. As a special teacher who only sees students for an hour a week, um, it can be difficult kind of building an ongoing relationship and having a presence with those students. But being the puppet man really, really helps. Um, as a focus tool, I've used it in a number of different ways. You know, the students will look at the puppet wherever the puppet is. So when I'm filming with the first graders, yesterday we were filming a water cycle song. If Waka wasn't in the shot, he was standing right up behind the camera and kind of singing and dancing along, keeping the kids looking at the camera. Um, one of the things I really like using the puppets for, especially in grades like three through five, is the puppets can be a foil for me where they'll ask questions. So we'll be talking about something and I can use Waka to check for understanding because one of the great things about the puppets is it gives you two, you know, experiences to work with or two personalities to work with and where I might understand everything in the class because I'm an adult and they expect me to know what the water cycle is. Waka might say, what's precipitation? Percipi is that like, is that like perspiration? Is that like sweating? What happens to sweat in the water cycle? Oh my goodness. So, so wait, tell me more about this book basket you have. And there's a number of different ways you can do that where you can just get students to talk about what they understand, explain what they understand more just by prompting them and using the puppets. Um, with the high schoolers, I wasn't doing so much teacher and puppet work. With the high schoolers, it was much more student and puppet work. Um, I was putting the puppet in the student's hands uh, more straight off with them. I'm sure I will so a bunch with my younger kids. Um, but with the high schoolers, it was all part of a, a big kind of project-based learning approach where they had to design and build the puppets. With any tool I use in my classroom, I want my students to be able to uh, really use it as well as I can. You know, if I'm using, uh, my students started building puppets basically because they asked to. Uh, the high schoolers saw that I was building puppets to use with the videos I was doing and they actually asked me, when do we get to build puppets? Um, because they knew from the way that I use technology in my English class that any time I did anything, they were going to be asked to do it shortly thereafter. Um, so for Julius Caesar, we did a project where we called it Project Caesar, and they had to design puppets and build them that were going to be different characters. Part of the design process was coming up with what the puppets would look like, and this is one of the conspirators. All of the conspirators were red, 
and it ended up that the royal family was blue. Um, I got Julius Caesar right here. And, uh, hello. So you can see this is Julius Caesar. Calpurnia, don't fail to be touched by the guy in the race for the fertility thing. Thanks. Claw, et tu, Brute. And he dies gloriously. Um, but he's blue. The conspirators were red. And the students built all of them. We came up with a pattern. They cut the work out. A number of students who had expressed interest in sewing did some of the sewing. They sometimes sewed in class, sometimes took it home. They brought the, uh, the sewed puppets back, and we stuffed them. Um, and now that we're past Julius Caesar, we can find other uses for the puppets. Um, one of the fun things about these guys is once you make them, you can pretty much do a lot with them. They're very repurposable. That makes me uncomfortable. That's not my voice. There it is. What's your name? I'm Batman. Uh, actually, uh, you're Bateman. The E is silent. Um, putting kids in charge of making puppets does take a lot of time. But what it does is it engages them as directors and designers and creators, and it empowers them. It's more than a metaphor for helping them develop their own voice. Um, puppets are amazing psychologically because of this ability to kind of be an ego proxy, where... Students are more willing to take risks because we don't expect a puppet to be perfect. Um, we can, sometimes in class, I'll use my puppets to model illogical thinking um, if I want to help students avoid a trap. And, you know, it can kind of be fun, especially if they're in on it. For example, there was one time where Waka was talking to Adam Bellow. Oh, you're, I make one bath mistake and you never let it go. And Waka, what were you talking about? I said that I had uh, interviewed one keynote speaker, and he was another keynote speaker. So now I'd interviewed two keynote speakers in two attempts. So I was betting at 200%. That's what I said. See, it's not that funny now, is it? I guess not, Waka. I'm sorry. Well, you should be. Um, so puppets allow students to be more comfortable making mistakes. Uh, this was really great with Shakespeare because students are not comfortable with the play Julius Caesar. You put a puppet on their arm, you ask them to work it out. The puppet's making most of the mistakes, so they aren't. Um, puppet is avatar. We, if we want our students to work in, uh, to do like videos or anything like that, we often don't want to put the students in the video. So we can have them work behind a puppet, and you put the puppet in the video, and you don't necessarily have any of the issues of putting the student faces in the video. Right. Right. Uh, I agree. Thanks, dog. So with... It's really great to put writing into action because they have to then do something with the puppets. Um, it makes, I'm a big fan of having students create an idea, script it out, do something with the puppets. It gives their writing purpose. Um, newscasts. I have a very close friend, Cheryl Morris, who is you, she's at an arts high school, and her kids are making newscasts with puppets called Ninja News. It's amazing. Um, and they're having fun. One of the key things that I've learned is that when you're working with students, while it does take a lot of time to have students build puppets, it's really important because puppets are fragile. Um, I spend I spend a lot of time maintaining and rebuilding puppets, and when kids use them, they get ripped up pretty quick because kids are used to like industrial strength quality toys, 
And while I have bought some puppets, and maybe that's a good argument for buying puppets, like I have Dolly, and Dolly is a purchase puppet, and Dolly is about as durable as a teddy bear. Wow. So, you know, the good folks at Folk Manus build a nice puppet, and some of them are actually big enough to fit my giant hands inside of. Wow. But um, by and large, I like building my own puppets, but it makes me really nervous when I give them to students to use them, or even when just the younger students, you know, want to hug and touch and grab Waka, because while he's great, he's, you know, largely built out of cardboard and hot melt glue. Um, which brings us to puppet construction. Who writes, the student or the puppet? I mean, do the students write as if they're students or if they're the puppets? Well, it depends on the, uh, the assignment, if they're, you know, what they're scripting. So I, you know, might have them script for the puppets, or they'll create a script that the puppets will act out. So they're writing as the author who's writing for a character to do something, and the puppet is one of those characters. Um, puppet construction is something that I've had a lot of interest expressed in, and the, um, the key to puppet construction is really um, <laughs> agreeing to do a lot of it. Uh, when I started the uh, looking into puppets, I, I went onto YouTube and I said, can YouTube teach me to build a puppet? And it turns out that it can. The first puppet I built was Dewey. And Dewey is a foam head puppet. And if you look, you can see that his head is just structured, constructed out of like inch or inch and a half inch thick foam, which is pretty intense. Uh, I actually use a thinner foam now. And he's, you know, good kid, kind of expressive. He's got a little tongue there. He's got his eyes. He's got the little pom-pom nose that's slightly off center. Oh, well. He's got uh, yellow feathers for hair. Um, and not an overly complex design, but this was the first of these that I made. Then I went on to make about six of these foam head puppets, just trying to get it right and get comfortable enough with what I was doing. Now, you notice that Dewey is just a head. I'm looking around for his uh, body. Here it is. So Dewey also has a, a body which is made of foam, and these arms, which are just kind of stuffed. Honestly, I'm not that great at making bodies and arms yet. I'm still working on figuring out how to make arms that are controllable and deciding if I want to mess with that level of complexity. I'm really big into imperfection and keeping things simple. Um, maybe that's just keeping myself sane in the process of trying new things. That's really important. You have to set limits because you can't do everything. Thank, thanks, Dewey. You're welcome. Um, Dewey tends to be very, very cheerful. Thank you. And uh, he's pretty energetic and sometimes a little bit distracting. I'm going to let that one slide. Um, when you're building, so really I spent a lot of time watching YouTube videos and then trying what they were doing and then making more YouTube videos so other people could try it. So if you look at that Puppet Craft playlist that's on the link that we shared earlier um, on bethedistraction.org, you can see a bunch of different videos, some of which I've made about building roundhead puppets. Um, you can get very far with a really simple design and hot glue. Um, but the more time you spend with a puppet, the better it's going to look and the better it'll operate. And there's really no substitute for craftsmanship. And there's no real substitute for kind of the experience of learning to build these. Now, you can pay $100 and get a kit sent to you where you can have everything work out perfect and have a really good puppet from the start. I've enjoyed the process of getting to learn how to make these puppets. It's really fun, but time consuming. He stays up late to sew. Thanks, Dewey. That was great. Um, 
So that's something to kind of consider as we go. The couple other things about puppet construction. Um, this is what we call a foam head puppet. I showed how you've got the uh, the foam backing there. There's Waka though, there's no foam in him. He is, and that was a foam head and body. Waka is all uh, fabric. He's just this uh, yellow fur that I found honestly in the uh, drama department. I'm still in fur, yo. And his mouth is made of actually two pieces of a plastic uh, gallon iced tea jug. And it's covered with black felt. And I've got some loops on the inside made out of duct tape where I can kind of put my thumb in to grab it so his mouth can move down. Yeah, 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 yeah. Shout out to Rotsko. Um, look at the chat window there. So he's really simply constructed, and I used a sewing machine to put him together. He is literally a pattern that just kind of looks like that. There's two halves to it, and then they were sewn together, and then I put in the giant mouth. Since the mouth is the main thing of the puppet, I mean, really, if you've got two eyes and a mouth, you've got a puppet. Words to live by, yo, um, because the eyeballs drive engagement, so you want eyes, and then you've got the mouth. Another, and what was nice about him was he was really easy as far as the body just being flappy. Now, I used a similar design with the, um, with the conspirators, but you can see that I made Walk's head smaller because with the conspirators, I was getting this giant kind of alien noggin thing going on. Um, so as I made them, I refined the, the pattern down to a smaller size. Well, it's a really good question, Craig. There, there are actually some really, why not 15 eyeballs? You, there are some great puppets out there with like 8, 10 eyeballs, and they probably are even more effective. Um, so with this guy, you can see that I kind of took the approach to the body and I added these arms. We can add wire controllers to the arms, but I just haven't done that yet um, because, again, I like to keep it simple. And we've got kind of a running joke with Waka about the fact that I have no arms, and that's just the way it is. And someday Waka may get arms, but I don't know. Um, I just have to figure out if it's useful. Now, one approach to arms is I can show you my friend Stuart. And uh, Stuart was one of the first, the, I think Stuart was the second foam head puppet I made. And... With Stuart, I took what I would call a Swedish chef approach to construction. And those of you who don't know, um, it is his go-to joke, uh, Craig. Those of you who don't know um, The Muppet Show, well, you should just stop this session right now and go watch everything ever by them, ever. But the Swedish chef is a construction where there's two people operating the puppet, and I just have myself, but one person is the mouth and one of the arms, and then another person is the other arm, or one person is the mouth and another person is just both of the arms. I'm not sure how they fit together underneath all of that, but they do. So I'm Stuart, hi, and... Uh, I'm kind of an old shirt with an ugly bow tie and uh, this glove that I made by tracing my hand on paper. I was made early in the process, so I've got this green nose. It's a big problem with the green screen. I have to actually cover it with a little uh, nose caddy that's brown, so there isn't a giant hole in my face when we green screen. So Stuart is um, also a foam head puppet, and I can show you that his foam is considerably slimmer than uh, Dewey's. So this means that he's more mobile and is certainly easier to build. Now, I mentioned green screening there. 
because way back at the beginning of this presentation, I did talk about the fact that I got into puppets because I wanted to do work with videos. Um, so one of the reasons that I like puppets and green screens is because it does keep the kids off camera. So if you want to make a video that you can share with people without violating security issues and privacy issues, you can put the students on the, you know, behind a, a screen with a puppet and you can have them do their work and share a video of it and you're not going to have people up in arms because you're, you know, endangering children because the children aren't in the video, they're just of the video. Um, I, I think there's a big argument to be made for green screen skills. Like, you can do green screen effects on your phone now and on iPads directly. And personally, I'm kind of amazed because I don't, I mean, I'm not ancient, but that used to be something you could only do in major production studios. And now it's very available to us. So as somebody who studied literacy, even when that focused mainly on writing, I want my students to be literate in this forum. I want my students to be literate in the language of video production, in the language of green screening, because that's really kind of part of it. Um, what? And so the green screen skills are kind of an important part of that. I want my students to be able to think through the production process, to be able to do the planning. Um, and, you know, be able to share things like that. The another thing is just video production. With all of us having access to fairly high quality video creation and exports now, um, that's something we need to teach students about, how to do it right, how to make good videos. Otherwise, there's just going to be more bad videos. Oh, no. That sounds horrible. It is horrible, Pi Pi. We don't want more bad videos, do we? No, they're long and pointless and full of just ridiculousness. Right. So we want videos that are actually like have a point and go somewhere. Does this count? I'm not sure, Pi Pi. Thanks for the vote of confidence. Um, so by teaching students, by having students make videos, they really get a sense of what a video should do, and they study the format much more closely. Um, just like I have my students read books and we write our own book and we print out our own book, why wouldn't I have them create videos, especially considering the fact that we've gone to a tablet enriched environment, some of it's one to one, some of it's several to one, and those tools are right at our fingertips, so why wouldn't we use them? Uh, another thing that I think is really important is it gets students engaged in the reiteration of the writing process. Um, as a teacher, it's really tough to get kids to go from draft to sharing it with somebody to getting response to making edits to going back and creating another draft and just keep moving through that process. They want to just start here and be done with it. But with the video, they can't try to argue that somehow what they're doing is great when it isn't because everyone can see that it's not great and that things need to be different and that they mispronounce something or the camera shot is off. Um, so that, so having that level of engagement in the process is important. It keeps them engaged in a reiterative creative process. Um, another thing that it really helps with is cooperation because you have to work together in order to create a video. It's a multi-person thing. You can't, I mean, you can shoot videos all by yourself, and I've done it, but for what I'm asking my students to do, it's something that they're really going to need to work with each other on. Um, and then unique and marketable content. When we want our students to be able to reach beyond the classroom, um, it's really difficult if the videos we're having them create are fraught with copyright infringement issues. 
So if my students build their own puppets, they're creating their own content. They're building their own character. Heck, they're building a fleece self instead of a digital self. They're building a fleece self that they're going to send out into the world to do work for them. Um, to me, that's pretty awesome. And the fact that they can do it in a way that allows them full ownership of it and to really get them to understand that and think about that is, is important to me. Um, so those are, you know, some of the key points of puppets and video creation. Um, I want to talk really quickly and then we'll go to questions about some really common things that come up with puppeting. And one of them is, and I've kind of grouped these all under puppet problems. Um, Walker, can you come in here for this? Oh yeah, sure, sure, sure. <coughs> So one of the really tough things about puppeting is the fact that you might have to use that funny voice for like an hour or an hour and a half or, you know, maybe even longer. So there is that question of sustainability. Is the voice a voice that you can use for a long amount of time? Right, that, that's what I was saying. You're, you're, you're even off screen. You don't have to say anything. So this voice is a lot like his normal voice, just kind of put up into his nose a little bit more. And several of his voices are just variations on this one. But this is, this is a low-stress voice. The high-pitched voices like Pie Pies and even Carrie Lady Geeks, what? And uh, Tina's, they, they're hard to do for a long amount of time. Yeah. Well, we, met, we mentioned Carrie Lady Geek. We should get her over here. Where, where is she? Um, another thing that is I learned really early on, especially when I'm making the puppets, and if you watch any of my puppet making videos, I probably say this too often, is that all of the mistakes you make will be with scissors. So... One of the most recent um, foam head puppets I built was Carrie Lady Geek. And I was trying to kind of build a puppet that had a, um, a body. And I was using kind of foam plus this Schoology t-shirt for her body. Um, and she's got the, you know, she's, she's got arms and... We'll kind of put her on here so you can get a sense of what she looks like. Hello. That light's really harsh. Did we talk about a diffuser? I thought we talked about a diffuser. All right, well, what do you got going on here? Oh, we're... We're webinaring. That's so cute. It wasn't on my calendar. Okay, so uh, I'm Carrie, and I don't really have a sustainable voice because this high pitch thing's a little hard to do for any amount of time. But I am the best of the puppets and the smartest. It's true. Um, th thanks, Carrie. If you watch the series on making a round head puppet, it's her head that I'm constructing. And when I completed that, I started doing some work just trying to figure out if I could kind of use a uh, T-shirt as a shortcut for a puppet body. I'm still not completely happy with that. Her shoulders are kind of huge. Um, her hair is awesome, and it's actually made out of a beard wig. So it's like a wig that someone would wear in order to have a big, like, Eastern European beard. And I just kind of glued it to her head. Um, Every mistake you make will be with scissors. When you're making puppets, you know, that whole measure twice, cut once thing, yeah, it's huge because as soon as it's too small, you're cutting into more fabric to use it. Um, so... 
so the um, how do I transition out of the puppet? This was something that I discovered when I was working in the first grade and I wanted to go from, you know, hey, it's talking with puppet time to it's time to play a game. I realized I needed both my hands, so I said, oh, no. For this next thing, I kind of need both my hands. Waka, yes. You need to take a nap. Take a nap. Yes, Waka, take a nap. Now, 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 now. And then he goes to sleep. Now, he doesn't have any eyelids, so he doesn't look asleep, but he snores. And then we just kind of fold him up and move on. And that seems to work really well, which I'm glad of, because, you know, if they're all clambering for one thing and you're trying to give them another, that's not going to work. Uh, but pretty much I can use the puppets to kind of hand the topic off to me. Um, what about the puppet haters? So there, in high school, there were students, but more than students, there were teachers. Um, who were just like, what is with the puppets? Uh, especially because we were spending a lot of time in English class constructing the puppets. And, you know, I had to answer that question a lot. And what I responded with was really focusing on the student learning that was being facilitated by the puppets. In that case, it was Shakespeare, and we were getting a much better understanding of the play because they were studying the design. They were making designer choices about the play. They were working with the text much clo more closely. With the younger grades I work with, honestly, I don't get that challenge very much because people see me working with the puppets a lot, and they see how engaged the students are. And, you know, they just love it. And the students get really enthusiastic about things that the puppets want to do. And they'll answer the puppets' questions, and they're just jazzed about working with the puppets. Um, the, the thing is, they do take a lot of time. Um, not so much with the teacher using puppets, but if you want the students to use puppets, you have to give them time to explore. You have to give them time to, like, develop a puppet personality. You have to find a way where they can build a puppet, take it home, and work with it. Um, because in order to get a puppet to work really well, you have to really develop their personality. You have to find their voice. You have to figure out what kind of puppet they are. You have to encourage them to be a nice puppet. Because if you build a nasty puppet, no one will want to talk to it. And you'll have to do like a whole puppet recovery makeover thing, like you know some of my puppets may have had to go through. Um, and if you are working with high schoolers, then you have to teach every, well, if you're working with students to make puppets, you have to make sure you have the time uh, for them to learn everything. Because you're going to be, thanks for sharing the, uh, the I movie trailer there for now. Uh, you have to teach, give them time to learn everything from sewing to gluing to how to thread a needle, um, et cetera. It's just not something that comes naturally to them at all. I was lucky because when I um, started making puppets as an adult, I did have the experience of sewing as a teenager to fall back on. And some of them, like Pi Pi here, have some pretty complicated hand sewing that I did. Um, from the details in her face, these ridges, to the just getting all of the pieces to meet in the back. Um, there you go. You can kind of see where all of the seams converge there. Uh, that, that took a lot of time. Uh, so you have to figure out where that time is going to come in and which of your students are going to be motivated enough to do it. Uh, I'm working on developing a program that I can do with K through third grade so that um, I can have them build puppets. And my biggest challenge with that is coming up with something that doesn't require hot melt glue because I don't think the kindergartners are going to be that cool with having their fingertips burned. Um, now, I really want to open this up to questions. There's been a lot of good discussion going on in the chat window, and I've tried to grab that as we've gone. Um, but we can open this up to questions, and I can drop the mic 
and I think you'll be able to pick it up once I drop it. I might need to enable it. Um. I have a question. Do you your puppets wrap? Can you repeat that? Um, I, I don't think the puppets have wrapped yet, but that's just because the students haven't, um, you know, empowered the puppets to wrap. It's a good idea. Uh, my puppets didn't even really sing until Tracy Walker made them sing. And she's made a couple of great videos of puppets singing with, like, the preposition song and the adverb song. Oh, you were hoping for freestyle rap? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know about that. I could... They both appear with me and behind the scene. Um... Maria. So if the, uh, with the younger kids, I do a lot of right next to me with the puppets. With the older kids, if I'm making a video, I'll bring the puppet into it, um, even if it's right at the beginning, just to kind of make it a little more interesting. Um, just one of the things I can talk to as we come up with other questions is the uh, the puppet parts. You can build puppet parts out of anything. Um, if you look at Dewey, his nose is a pom pom, and his eyes are made out of just felt circles. But when I made Carrie. Her nose is a pom-pom, but her eyes are actually made out of um, styrofoam balls that I have cut. So they're three-dimensional. Hey, Simon. And um, I had picked some of those up at the craft store. I try not to buy many things, and really, this is not something that I'm really enjoying buying. But now... Our school has a ping pong table, which is great because the kids break ping pong balls all of the time. And I have instructed the, or I've asked the uh, wonderful people at the front desk that when kids make, when kids break a ping pong ball, they should bring the ping pong ball to me because this nose is a felt covered ping pong ball. Uh, this is. Is this Brutus? No. Yes, this is Brutus from Julius Caesar. And uh, I'm struggling to try to remember the, the speech, but you can kind of see he's that same kind of pattern that the conspirators are, where he's got the two arms here. And he's made out of a super fluffy fleece, and that's, you know, kind of nice. Um, to give you a sense of the process, we've also got... this one where it's not even completely stuffed yet. This is just kind of the shape with the mouth in it, but we need to fill out the stuffing so its mouth corners don't point out so much. Um, but yeah, without any of the features on it, you can see it kind of looks alienish. Anyway, um, any other questions from the main room? We can open the microphone up again. I Sorry for dominating it there. Well, Maria, I hope you do try it out. I hope that any of you who um, give this a shot, contact me. Uh, my email, I would, love to, I would love to hear more about how you use puppets in class. I'd love to see examples of how to use puppets in class. Awesome, Maria, that's great. My email is essay.writing at gmail.com. 
Um, I am all over the Twitters at Sam Kutui. And we have a Twitter chat on Tuesday evening, um, Tuesday evenings, uh, 5 p.m. Pacific time uh, in the U.S. And we've had people from all over the world in that chat. It's a pedagogy and technology on Tuesday chat. Um, my work is at bethedistraction.org as well as www dot mypaperlessclassroom.org. Uh, more puppets at Be the Distraction than Paperless Classroom. Uh, thank you so much for everybody. Uh, this is just a really fun session. I look forward to doing more like this in the future. Thank you so much, Sam. I just wanted to go ahead and cut in here for all the awesome information. Sam was one of my first contacts on Twitter, and he is more than willing to help out in any which way, I was very fortunate not only to meet him, but also the, the puppets. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Stay in contact. Awesome.